Thank you everyone for tuning in on your Monday evening. Uh, welcome to those joining us for the first time and everybody coming back. There's a lot of regular names popping up. That's awesome. For those of you tuning in for the first time, um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna. I currently serve as the Divisional Superintendent um, at Division 176 over in Victoria, British Columbia. And I am administrating the session tonight. Uh, tonight we've got Dr. Sam Brophy joining us. He'll be talking about uh, cardiovascular or cerebrovascular emergencies. And I'll let him do a better introduction of himself than I am currently doing. Um, but before that, a couple housekeeping notes. During Sam's presentation, if you have any questions, there's a chat box for those of you new to Zoom. There's a chat box at the bottom of your screen. Please type your questions in there and I'll be kind of curating and moderating. And we'll let Sam address them there. But until then, just type them in. I'll make note of them and I'll get Sam to answer them. Um, if you could please refrain from trying to answer other people's questions in that chat box, that would be great. It just kind of helps me keep track of everything that's asked. At the end of the session, once Sam is done, we can then kind of unmute people if people would like and do um, a bit of a discussion. But until that point, I'm going to keep everybody except Sam's cameras and mics off just to limit how much background noise there is. And with that, I'll uh, mute myself and let Sam talk. Awesome. Thanks. Can you guys hear me? And yeah, can hear okay, and cool. see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom can be kind of challenging. So I have the chat box open and I'll, I'll try and respond to them as I go. But if not, Anna can let me know. Um, so my name's Sam and I'm talking to you guys tonight about uh, pre-hospital, mainly CVA and TIA. And what I plan to be doing is focusing on um, the different types of stroke, what causes a stroke, uh, the difference between a TIA versus a CVA. Um, I'll kind of go over a high yield clinical assessment that can be done pre-hospital and uh, the treatment is, as well as mimics of stroke that you want to watch out for. Um, uh, and, and most importantly, my goal is to ultimately go over how the pre-hospital aspects of each of these is really important and can actually influence what happens to the patient both in the pre-hospital and in the hospital setting. Um, so please, yeah, ask questions as we go. I do like, uh, I, I've given talks for the Paramedic Academy and the, uh, and St. John Ambulance before, uh, and I really do like in interactive lectures rather than being purely didactic. Uh, I know that's challenging on Zoom, but I'll try and ask you guys a few questions. And if you can just type some responses into the chat and I'll hopefully see them pop up and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I used to be a medical first responder with St. John Ambulance. I worked as both an EMR and a PCP with uh, BCAS. I did my, oh, someone's making noises. I did my uh, doctor of medicine at the UBC and I'm currently specializing in emergency medicine at Island Health. And I'm also halfway done my uh, master's in public health at Harvard, which has been really interesting. Uh, thing to do being doing public health during this whole global pandemic. So if, uh, at the end of this presentation, I'll have my email up there. If you're interested in any of these steps that I took or want to reach out and talk about any of it, please uh, feel free to get in touch. So let's just jump into it then. What is a stroke? And uh, this guy at the back of the boat here is clutching his chest. So he's probably not having a stroke. He's probably having a heart attack or something or um, but a stroke is essentially, it's it, lots of other names for a stroke. It can be a CVA, which stands for cerebrovascular accident, uh, a brain attack, kind of like a heart attack, uh, cerebral infarction, hemorrhage, ischemic stroke, or intracranial hemorrhage, lots of different names that all kind of mean one overlying or underlying thing in that 
basically it's an interruption of blood supply to brain tissue resulting in brain injury. Much like a heart attack, if the blood and oxygen and nutrients can't get to the heart tissue, it dies and that causes pain and causes other things down the road like heart failure. That's exactly what a stroke is. It's, it's a lack of blood supply to the viable tissue in our brain uh, leading to brain damage and sequelae of that. So two main types of cerebrovascular accidents um, or strokes. I'll give you a sec to think to yourself how you would break down the two types of strokes. Um, and for me, uh, I have a simple brain. I like to keep things simple so I can understand them. So basically, since it's an interruption of blood supply to the brain, that means either blood is blocked from getting to the brain or a certain area of the brain, or blood is going somewhere else. So the two types of CVA are ischemic versus hemorrhagic. And ischemic being much like a heart attack where one of our blood vessels supplying the brain gets blocked by any multiple multitude of things uh, and therefore leading to brain ischemia and infarction. Uh, or the blood's going somewhere else where that blood vessel instead of being clogged has actually burst and therefore isn't delivering blood to that area of the brain because it's leaking out elsewhere. Much, much more common to have the ischemic stroke, about 85% to 15%. You'll find different statistics out there, but definitely much more common to have the ischemic than the hemorrhagic stroke, uh, which is probably a good thing because it's a lot easier for us to treat as well and usually is less devastating, but we'll get into that as well. So kind of a just pictorial representation here of ischemic versus hemorrhagic uh, in that on screen left, the ischemic stroke where the blood is blocked due to a clot in one of the arteries leading to that whole gray area of brain tissue that has, la has a lack of blood supply uh, or hemorrhagic where the, the blood supply is, it almost looks like it has better blood supply, but I promise you it does not because it's leaking out across the brain and brain tissue rather than going to the capillaries and having that exchange of oxygen and nutrients that's required for our brains to function. Um, to, to further represent this, uh, I'll give you an example on the next slide of what these two look like on a CT scan. And I know that this isn't something that you guys will be doing pre-hospital, uh, but uh, if ever, you send a patient in or you work with EMS and you, and you bring a patient into me and I, I see them and I'm one of the doctors that's taking care of them, uh, I'm fine to give you that follow-up and I can bring you over to the computer or send you the pictures of, uh, of the patient you took care of with their permission uh, to show you and give you that uh, high yield follow-up. On screen left here, again, it's kind of difficult to see. I hope you can see my little laser pointer here. Uh, but but the ischemic stroke, it, it's difficult to pick up on a non-contrast CT scan, but what we see is this area right here. It's difficult to see, but uh, we, we call this loss of gray-white differentiation. Whereas you look on the other side, you can see all these little folds and dips and crevices in the brain, which is normal. But over here, it's just a big gray blotch, and that's essentially representing ischemia. Whereas over on this side, I think you can probably spot the abnormality here is this big blotch of white and that usually represents acute blood because acute blood on CT is dense like bone so it shows up really bright so when we see that we know that there's bleeding into the brain which is bad so to further break down the different types of stroke is we can actually break down the types of ischemic stroke into two main types and I'll give you a second to think about this as well. But essentially, usually it is a clot of some form and blocking that blood vessel and preventing that blood from getting to the brain tissue. And that clot, I think, again, trying to keep things simple in my mind, is the clot either developed there or it came from somewhere else in the body. So there's either a cerebral thrombosis or a cerebral embolism. And again, thrombosis is blood or a, a plaque uh, that blocks an artery supplying the brain tissue that developed right there in that artery or vessel. And the cerebral embolism is a blood clot that breaks off from a thrombus that developed somewhere else and ended up getting lodged into one of those vessels in our brain and then subsequently causing that ischemia. So again, thrombosis, again, a pictorial representation. The plaque is developing within the artery in the brain and cutting off the blood supply there, whereas an embolism comes from somewhere else. So let's try and use the chat a little bit just for fun. And if it 
doesn't happen or Zoom shuts down or explodes, we'll just reset and keep going. But what, what do you guys think are some risk factors for developing a cerebral embolism or thrombus? Let's see a few. Nice, hypertension, totally one. Obesity, yep, comes along with a lot of other stuff too. This is fun, I like this. Family history of stroke, yeah, so totally. Bleeding disorders, AFib, Kate, yes. Smoking, totally. Everybody should stop smoking. Diabetes, clotting disorders. All right, this is amazing. So what, what I wanted to do is, I, I, I know this is a talk for pre-hospital care and for, for anywhere from standard first aiders to paramedics to nurses. And I, I do like to go into a little bit more of that depth of what we're talking about so we can try and understand a little bit better. So while this doesn't, this is a little bit more academic knowledge, uh, it's good to know because you guys just outlined all of these. And there's, there's something called Burkow's triad and it's the three necessary factors or not necessary, but three factors that predispose one to clot formation. And you essentially talked about them all. Yeah, drug use as well, totally. Um, so Verkaus triad, three factors. Is it, I don't know if somebody's writing on the screen, but that's, I don't know how, can we take that off? <laughs> Yeah, nice. Okay. That's cool. I didn't know you could write on the screen, but I'll show you the three factors. <laughs> yes, birth control. Yeah. So, so these are the three things that predispose you to forming clot. Anything that includes stasis of blood flow, endothelial injury, or hypercoagulability. So all of you mentioned things that fall into these categories. So stasis of blood flow, anytime that blood is pooling anywhere and isn't consistently moving tends to clot. Right? If you took a sample of your own blood and put it into a petri dish and watched it, it would form a clot. And that's why someone mentioned AFib, and we'll get to that in a second, and, and how that stasis of blood flow. Hypercoagulability, lots of things can cause this. Certain medications can cause this. Certain underlying conditions like a family history or uh, uh, bleeding disorders or coagulopathies like somebody mentioned, or cancer can cause hypercoagulability. And endothelial injuries. So the endothelium is just a, a fancy medical word for the inner lining of those blood vessels. And if there's an injury, like a small tear in the wall of that endothelium, that's an area that our platelets can grab onto and all of a sudden it forms this big clot. And one of the biggest reasons for endothelial injury is hypertension, like somebody said right off the bat. So this is Verkaus triad, and uh, if you start seeing these things all together, that's when you get all your all your strokes and heart attacks and PEs and then anything else that clotting leads to. So AFib, somebody mentioned this. So this is an example of AFib. I don't know if the heart's moving on your screen, but it's moving on my screen. Um, but essentially showing that what we know is the atria in atrial fibrillation are just squiggling there like a bag of worms. And that leads to pooling of blood because you lose that atrial kick where we're pushing with every beat, pushing the blood out of the atria. When they're just wiggling like a bag of worms, sometimes the blood can start pooling there and creating create a clot in those atria and eventually that clot will go into the ventricle and then get shot up into the brain, which is why one of the biggest risk factors for stroke is AFib and why, often why people who have atrial fibrillation are on anticoagulants or blood thinners like warfarin or apixaban. And uh, often when we see strokes that uh, are a result of AFib, usually they're quite devastating because these are the ones that have had time to form a huge clot and then eventually that clot goes in transit and straight to the brain and they can be quite, uh, quite bad. ICP seems to me to cause more herniation than initial. Yes, okay. Trying to keep up with the chat. So here's an example of how a hemorrhagic stroke can present as well in CT scan and how it can evolve. This is a patient that came to me in the emergency department at VGH uh, in Victoria a, a few months back. And uh, this was the initial one and they were slightly altered uh, on the way in and they were sent in from a field. I actually think they were sent in from a, a community event. And uh, initially they were complaining of headache and they were a little bit altered and confused. And I ended up scanning them three hours later and they had taken a turn for the worse and had gone essentially unresponsive. And we re CT'd them and this is what it shows. So just an example of how devastating and how quick these can evolve. 
and why hemorrhagic strokes are especially scary. So let's further break down those hemorrhagic strokes as well, because we can get two types of these. And the main two are, again, different, basically where in the brain are you bleeding? So there's the subarachnoid hemorrhage and then the intracerebral or intraparenchymal hemorrhage. So big words, but subarachnoid is there's, uh, some of you may know there's multiple layers covering the brain and the spinal cord called the meninges. The middle one is called the arachnoid. And beneath the arachnoid, between the arachnoid and the, the pia mater, there's a space. And this contains our blood vessels. And often this is where people can develop aneurysms. And if you have people, when you hear that thunderclap headache, where all of a sudden they're fine, and then boom, they have the worst headache of their life. This is really concerning for a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and often it's an aneurysm that's developed there over time, and it's burst. Intracerebral, on the other hand, is a blood vessel that's usually in the deep brain tissue, and that's what bleeds. Often that is usually due to hypertension, but can be due to many other things like trauma. Um, so this is the same picture before. Oh, I guess this was, so this was to demonstrate uh, uh, intraparenchymal versus subarachnoid. Uh, this is actually an intraparenchymal bleed. Um, so both can be quite devastating because we often think of the subarachnoid bleed as uh, very scary and, and the thunderclap headache, but both can be quite horrible. So stepping back from strokes, We'll talk about TIAs or a transient ischemic attack or a mini stroke. And the definition of this is a little bit different than when I, I was initially taught. Um, and what it is, is it's defined as a transient episode of neurologic dysfunction caused by brain or spinal cord ischemia without acute infarction. Now, some of you may have been like me and they've been taught that it's usually a stroke or stroke-like symptoms that resolve within 24 hours. Um, but no longer does time matter. And the reason is because what we were finding is people who had TIAs and they had all their neurologic symptoms resolved. So they came in with a facial droop and then 24 hours later, they had no more facial droop. We called it a TIA, but we would MRI those people and we would still see that their brain tissue had infarcted and that there was irreversible brain damage. So we no longer call it a TIA based on time. Basically, we're calling it a TIA if no... Uh, stand by. I think Sam's <laughs> Sam's frozen. Uh, one sec. Hello. All right, you're back. <laughs> okay. What? Where did we get to there? Um, you were just talking about the TIAs. Did, we, did I say seconds as cells? No. <laughs> oh, all right. Let's, well, we'll go back to TIA really quickly. But so essentially with the TIA is that uh, it, it no longer matters about time. That it, it, it used to be that the neurologic deficits resolved after 24 hours, uh, but we don't care about that now because those patients, we would MRI, and even if they had no more deficits, we would still see brain damage that's irreversible. So it doesn't matter how long, a TIA is any neurologic dysfunction that resolves and doesn't cause irreversible brain damage. So seconds is cells, meaning uh, the longer you wait during any sort of infarction, the, the longer and the, the more your brain cells die. So approximately 2 million brain cells die each minute during a stroke. I promise you that that fact is incorrect. I got it off like Wikipedia or something, but it, it it's just to highlight that time is very important. And the longer you wait to get them to definitive care, uh, the, the worse outcome they're gonna have, right? So what does that mean? That means if you're EMS, turn on the lights and sirens. If you're out of St. John duty, that's calling 911. If you suspect this is a stroke or a TIA or even a potential, it's worth getting them seen quite quickly. 
uh, because we'll also determine what we do for them in the hospital. Signs and symptoms of stroke. Do you guys know what fast is? Do you do the fast? Yeah, yeah, nice. <laughs> Good demonstration there. Here, let me open the chat again. All right, cool. Um, so fast, and then there's also now this fast van that comes out as well. So fast van, not just a speedy vehicle. Um, it's a way of doing your regular fast, which is looking for the facial droop, the arm drift, and the slurred speech, and then the time last seen normal. And then adding in the van, looking for vision, specifically a gaze deficit, aphasia, and neglect. And uh, basically, this is supposed to differentiate that you call into us ahead of time and saying, you know, someone has a potential hot stroke, but then if if they have any of these other ones with vision, like gaze deficits, um, aphasia, or neglect, that's considered to be um, a potential large vessel occlusion. And to be honest, this is essentially what I do as a doctor when uh, the paramedics come in with a potential hot stroke, they'll page us overhead and say, you know, emergency physician to triage for stroke assessment. And I go and I just do fast ban. I don't do anything else special. Um, the thing that gets people is that what the vision, the aphasia and the neglect actually are. So vision is, are they looking to one side and no matter what you do, you try and get them to follow your finger to the other side and they can't, they're just looking to the right. And uh, often they'll be looking towards the side of the stroke. So just a fun anatomy fact that if they are gaze deviated to the left, chances are that the left hemisphere is involved in the stroke, but not always because medicine always, as soon as you're confident in something, medicine finds a way to make you feel bad about yourself. Um, aphasia, uh, or aphasia is naming difficulties. And this is different than dysarthria where you have you know, slurred speech or mumbling things. That's saying, I hold this up to them and say, what is this called? And they'll be like, oh yeah, that's a, you know, it's a pen for those of you who you can't see. But they'll say to me, you know, oh, that's, yeah, of course, that's the thing you write. Um, no, I know it, I know it. And they just can't get the word out, which is super frustrating for them because obviously they know that it's a pen, but they can't find that word to say. Neglect is also ignoring a certain side of the body. It can be left or right. And that would be specifically if they, if you stand on one end of the stretcher on the right end and they are, they see you and they interact with you and you wave and they wave back and you stand on the other and you wave and they won't see you. Or if you, it, it's a very strange phenomenon. If you show them their own left hand and they're saying like, who, that's not my hand. I don't know what that is. It's a very strange phenomenon um, and uh, quite interesting, but obviously also quite scary. So uh, if you see it, I, I recommend you do an assessment, but I wouldn't play around too long. I'd probably call 911 as well while you're doing your assessment and playing around. So fast van, very important. And if you do this in the field and you have a good fast van, it, it's, the job is done. Like I'm gonna do the same thing when I get there, but often the paramedics or whoever calls ahead will come in and say, you know, this is the fast van. And I'm like, ah, great. I've already decided in my mind where I'm going to uh, send the patient, which is, well, well, we'll talk about that in a bit. Oh dear. Uh, so, okay, so this is, this is uh, what I just said. I just left this in the slides for your guys' benefit. You can read through this if you want, but we just talked about it all. So common stroke symptoms, uh, you know, they're, it's vague and it can represent a lot of things. It's weakness, paralysis, paresthesias, which is a fancy word for numbness or tingling. The vision changes, speech changes, swallowing difficulties or drooling, uh, loss of memory, vertigo, personality changes, drowsiness, it, it, it's all the neurologic stuff, which is always very vague, unfortunately, is the brain controls literally everything that the body does. And if any part of the brain is affected, you can see any symptom. But these are the most common ones. And, and if they're accompanied or they're all together in a cluster, that's when you should start being concerned. 
So here's something you can refer for yourself. I'm going to take away almost all of this because what I really want to do is compare the main signs and symptoms of ischemia versus hemorrhage. Uh, because again, these are the two things, right? The blood is blocked or blood is going somewhere else because it's hemorrhaging into the brain. And often in ischemia, you'll get that contralateral, so opposite side of the brain that's affected, hemiparesis, which is the weakness, or hemisensory, which is numbness, tingling, or can't, or loss of sensation. The contralateral, again, opposite side of the brain, visual field deficit, meaning they can't see the right half of vision in both eyes, um, or aphasia, which is uh, the, the difficulty of producing words, which sometimes I have while giving lectures. And um, it, interestingly, if you have the aphasia, it says left there, and about 95% of people who are right-handed will have their, what's called, it's called Broca's area, and that's where we generate our speech in our brain. And if this area is affected, that's what gives us the aphasia. So 95% of people who are right-handed have this area in the left. And of those who are left-handed, it's actually still about 90%. Most people have this in the left. Uh, so often, you know, I see people who come in and they can't name things or they can't produce words. And I say, oh, you know, it's probably a left-sided stroke. And, you know, people who don't know this get so impressed by me because they think I'm a superhero. But but it's just the odds are with you that this is left-sided. But again, of course, as soon as you say this really confidently, it's going to end up being on the right and that 5% of the population just so you feel really bad about yourself because I've done that too. Um, so with the hemorrhage though, this is where we get that thunderclap headache, right? And, and here's something we need to, to suss out as well is what exactly is a thunderclap headache? Because, you know, I ask every time I ask somebody or if a med student's working with me and they say, you know, they saw a patient, they come and talk to me. It's like, yeah, the, the patient's having a thunderclap headache. And I say, okay, well, wh what do you mean by thunderclap headache? With, without fail, everyone's like, you know, like, <laughs> that's it. I'm like, okay, well, clapping your hands doesn't really describe anything to me. So I like to quantify it. And in my mind, a thunderclap headache, some people say uh, 60 seconds, I say 10 seconds. And I say it's 10 seconds from the onset of the headache to, the, to reaching its peak in pain. So when they say, yes, this is the worst headache of my entire life, um, but it took three hours to go from starting to my 10 out of 10 pain, it's a little, that, I wouldn't qualify that as a, a thunderclap headache. Whereas if they say, yeah, within 10 seconds, it was zero to 100, like, holy cow, then I'd be worried about it. Um, uh, question in the chat. The headache and neck stiffness sounds close to meningitis. Differences in signs and symptoms. Yeah, so, so yeah, so neck stiffness, exactly. So, and that's because that subarachnoid space where we have that blood, that goes all the way down through the meninges and down to the spinal cord as well. So it irritates the back of their neck. So they do often have it. I would say the differences in the signs and symptoms would definitely be this onset in that if it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you'd be expecting it to start within, within a minute. Whereas meningitis is going to come on a little bit more insidiously over hours to days to weeks even. And that's going to be accompanied with other things like fever, chills. They're going to have a high white blood cell count. Basically, if, if you get the infectious picture from them and they have a high temperature, you're maybe a little bit more concerned about things like meningitis. Whereas if, you know, they were otherwise well and then boom, all of a sudden headache, neck stiffness, then, then that's concerning for subarachnoid. So history plays a huge role in there. Hope that answered the question. Um, another thing here is it does say decreased level of consciousness. And that's another big thing too, is that often people with the ischemia, ischemic strokes, they'll be, they'll have right-sided weakness or they can't talk, but otherwise they're well. They can look at you, their vital signs are normally, usually normal or within the normal limits. Whereas people who are having a hemorrhage into their brain are unconscious or are vomiting or look super ill. So that's another way to uh, distinguish that. Would it be like pressure type feeling with the pain? I don't know. It, it's, it, pain is different for everybody. I hope I never can answer that question <laughs> personally. But uh, I think any severe pain in that area, whether it's sharp or pressure or tearing or anything in severe head and, and neck and, and it's acute onset, I'd, I'd be worried. 
So this is my simplified approach to, to differentiating them. And it's not always true. Like I say, medicine does that great job of making you feel dumb when you think you're finally smart. And uh, so take this with a grain of salt, but ischemic strokes, you know, you get those focal findings where it's like your hand is weak or the right arm is weak or the right leg or whole right side even, but then the left side's unaffected and otherwise you're, you're okay, they're awake, they're talking to you. They tend to not have a ton of pain. Whereas hemorrhagic strokes often come along with a terrible headache and they're systemically unwell. You know, they're vomiting, they look sick, they have an altered level of consciousness. Both are bad, but you know, we can treat one a little bit more than the other and we'll get into that in a sec. So you can kind of use this as your own personal differentiating criteria when you're assessing people in the field that uh, you think might have this. Okay. How are we doing? I haven't logged out yet or frozen, right? I'm still here. Okay. So assessment wise, we're going to go through this, the primary that you guys know and love, the ABCs, the history and physical exam, and then we'll talk about imaging. This is a CAT scan. I think I'm funny. Uh, so let's go over the history. Do you guys still use sample? Please someone type in and say yes. Ah, oh, thank God. Okay, so sample. Um, who who can who can be the first to type out what sample stands for? Oh, a little competition. Love the cat. Yeah, I know. It's an amazing cat. Signs, symptoms, allergies, medications, past history, last oral intake events. Oh, M. Ashton 1054. Strong work. So that's what I have exactly, I think. You had signs and symptoms just because you wanted to one up me, I guess, but that's okay. Um, so this is perfect. Sample is, you know, I started as, uh, yeah. I started as an MFR with St. John Ambulance, but I have used sample through every single step. As a paramedic, as a doctor, as like everything I use sample because it works and it, it does, it goes through everything. The only thing I don't like about sample is last oral intake. Um, and so, because first of all, I don't know if everybody else knows this and I was just really ignorant, but I never knew why I was asking that. You're like, why do I care when they had, you know, food last? but it's in case they end up needing surgery. And then the surgeons will say, you know, oh, when did they eat last? Well, actually it'll be the anesthesiologists that say, when did they have anything to eat last, like food or drink? And then you can tell them and feel slightly better about yourself. But really if someone needs an emergency surgery, they're, yeah, nav, oh, hey, nav, yeah. Um, but if someone needs an emergency surgery, they're, they're gonna get it anyways. And uh, nav can try intubating for once in a difficult situation. And uh, exactly, yeah. So in an emergency setting, they're going to be treated as a, as a full stomach. So I'm suggesting that we take that last oral intake and we're going to change it to last normal. And honestly, I, I would say you could do this for anybody. Um, but this is one of the most key questions in your history when assessing somebody with a potential stroke because it is going to change what we do when they get to the emergency department. So... Physical exam wise, we're gonna take vital signs and what vital sign must be included. It's not a traditional vital sign, but let's see it. Come on, Chad. GCS, BP, yeah, of course, all of these. GCS, yeah, pupils, sure, yeah, love all these. This is a little bit misleading because it's not technically a vital sign. And I'm, but I'm pretty sure you guys check this in the field. Yeah, blood sugar, totally. Get a glucose. I don't know if that's in our, uh, I don't know if that's in, our, in, the, in the scope these days because things change around with St. John, I know. But getting a glucose is extraordinarily important. And there have been a few times that, not in scope, okay. Well, make sure that the paramedics get a glucose when they get there, okay? You look them in the eye. <laughs> And you make sure you get that glucose um, because what happens is it can, it's one of the most 
common mimics and it's happened before that paramedics have brought patients into me and you know, we get paged overhead to go see the stroke and we take, I say, what was the glucose? And they're like, oh, I didn't check and it's okay. And you check and it says critically low or LO or whatever. And then you give them some sugar and all their symptoms go away and you've cured their stroke. That wasn't a stroke. So it's a little embarrassing. So just trying to save you guys some face, uh, get a glucose or make sure the paramedics do. Um, and a neurological exam. So this is something you guys can do. Uh, and so we'll do the fast van scale, which you guys can see that we've already gone through. You can have that card and go by that. I would do a level of consciousness and I would do AVPU. Do you guys know what AVPU is? Yeah, so alert, verbal, pain, or unresponsive, and not GCS. This is just a little bit of a soapbox I like to stand on in that the GCS scale is great and it's, it's fun to know. Uh, it was created for traumatic head injuries. Uh, meaning if somebody hit their head really hard, you give them, they give you, you can assess a GCS and you can follow that. So technically speaking, you shouldn't really be using GCS unless it's a, a traumatic injury. So I often say, you know, alert verbal and pain or unresponsive and it gives you the same picture. And if anyone ever tells you like, well, we, what was the GCS? You can, I don't know, give them my phone number and I'll, I'll go to bat for you. Um, oh, here's the GCS but we don't need to know it right now. So I'm gonna skip on. Uh, so orientation, this is, you know, are they alert and oriented times three is what everyone says, a person, place, and time. Do you know who I am? Do you know who you are? Do you know where you are? Where are we right now? And do you know what, what day, what year, what month this is? And um, that gives us a sense of how they're doing on, on that front. Checking their pupils, exactly right. So looking, uh, for how many, how many, what do you guys write on your PCR or thing for when pupils are fine? Anybody? Pearl. Yeah. Three plus three plus. Ooh, that's, that's extra. Nice. Um, so pearl meaning pupils equal and react to the light. Perfect. I love that. Do you guys ever write per la with an A? Question mark. Nice. Let's leave it that way. You've heard it, only in EMR. So the A stands for accommodation. And I find that people don't really know what accommodation is and it doesn't really change anything. So some people, accommodation is when you say you're getting them to follow your finger or, or a pen and they're following it. And theoretically what should happen is as you move your pen towards their face and they, kind of cross their eyes and look at it, their pupils are actually supposed to constrict a little bit and dilate as, they, as it moves away. Uh, and that's accommodation, but people don't really ever check that. And I, I don't think it's gonna change anything we do. So I would leave it at Pearl or three plus three plus if you wanna get extra fancy. Um, so pupils and then strength and sensation. This is as simple as checking grips bilaterally, putting your fingers up and saying, you know, reach up, grab my fingers and give them a squeeze and see how they do. And then can they lift their feet on either side off of the stretcher um, up to touch your hand? And if they can do it essentially both, and then you can just check distal sensation by just light touch. Feeling, can you feel my fingers at the end of your fingers and same on their feet? And that's just a quick check to let us know if there are any gross deficits in motor or sensation. Um, so all things you can do in the field and all stuff that I'm just gonna do in the hospital and gonna give you a good sense of how severe this potential event is. So I call this the FLOPS exam, uh, fast man, LOC, orientation, pupils and strength and sensation. I copyrighted this back in 2018 um, by, by making this slide and putting a little copyright symbol next to it. I don't have any rights to it actually, but if you wanna spread it, spread it, I, I like it. So imaging, when they get to us uh, afterwards, what kind of imaging are we gonna end up doing? That CAT scan, right meow. Throwing them through the donut of truth, which is, the CAT scan. And, and the way we do it, the CAT scan, you can do it. What we often do is if I'm concerned that this is a hot stroke, we'll order a CT slash CTA. 
And what that means is um, computer tomography and computer tomography angiogram. So that gives us both a general look with no contrast at the head and that looks for any big bleeds or that loss of gray white differentiation we saw in the ischemic stroke initially. And then the angio is where they inject contrast into the blood vessels, into the arteries, and that lights up and it, it'll show us any areas that you'll see blood going along and all of a sudden it stops abruptly. Uh, that's where we're concerned that there might be a clot and we can actually do something about it. So they're gonna come to me and get a CAT scan after you guys have done your FLOPS exam. And then treatment. There are different ways to treat a hemorrhagic stroke and an ischemic stroke. And let's talk about them. Hemorrhagic stroke, again, blood is going somewhere else. A blood vessel in the brain has burst and it is filling blood inside our cranium, all overlaying our brain. These patients have a bad headache, they look unwell, they might be unconscious, they might have that thunderclap headache. Uh, what do they need? They need blood pressure control because we wanna prevent uh, further bleeding by making their blood pressure too high, but we also don't want the blood pressure to go too low because if the blood pressure goes too low, yeah, the bleeding will stop, but then all of a sudden, the rest of the brain doesn't have any perfusion. So tight blood pressure control, we're gonna treat them for increased ICP, which is intracranial pressure. And we have lots of ways to do that with IV medications and positioning and, and, and then neurosurgery, where we are gonna drill a hole in their head and suck out the blood. By we, I don't mean me. Um, I had to try and do it once in the emergency room. And unfortunately it didn't go well, but that's because I'm not a neurosurgeon. And the big thing here is that in the pre-hospital setting, you can you guys can help us with all of this. So I know this one isn't in your scope in St. John Ambulance, but again, look those paramedics in the eye and say this patient needs an IV, right? Uh, because we're going to give lots of IV medications for both blood pressure control to keep it quite tight and to treat for increased intracranial pressure. And getting an initial blood pressure on your vital signs really helps us to see the trend in which the blood pressure is going. Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it staying the same? How fast do we need to act on this? Uh, so very important. For increased intracranial pressure, what do you guys think we could do? In, you can do in the field. Anyone? Chat time. Positioning. Oh, I love it. Exactly. What kind of positioning for bonus points? Head down, okay. I'm gonna argue head up. But head down is gonna come into play. And now, nah, very good. Head up and uh, often what this is doing is just getting gravity on your side. So there's swelling in the brain and as soon as we lift them up, gravity is gonna try and pull some of that fluids. Flip that, reverse it, yeah, you got it. Uh, gravity is going to help that uh, any excess fluids, blood, or whatever else can drain down into the body from the head, and that's going to help us uh, uh, treat the intra, uh, increased intracranial pressure. And then neurosurgery. What are you guys going to do in the field for this? No, I'm just kidding. Just don't. Please don't attempt neurosurgery in the field. Um, or if you do, don't tell you don't tell anyone I told you to do it. But essentially, this is where you need to go code three to a neuro hospital and write some targets on the forehead. Yeah, exactly. Burr hole here and here. Yeah, stamp them. Exactly. So it, it, it basically, this means they, they just need to go quick and they need to go to a hospital where they have neurosurgical intervention. So in Victoria, that's Vic, Victoria General Hospital is our neurosurgery hospital. And if you're elsewhere in the, the world or the province, find whichever is closest to you. Uh, and then for ischemic stroke, again, so this is where the blood is blocked and artery uh, is clogged off. We're not getting blood and circulating to the brain tissue. Uh, usually we have the focal findings, but otherwise they're systemically well. And maybe we do that CT angio and we see that blood vessel with the contrast and all of a sudden oh, the blood vessel stops abruptly and we think that's where the clot is right there. Um, so we can do things with that clot. We can thrombolize it, which is a way of basically saying explode the clot with medication. Um, or we can do endovascular thrombectomy, which is where we go inside the blood vessel, grab that clot and pull it out. And we'll talk about that. Um, they need to meet criteria for this. And we can increase brain, we need to increase brain perfusion. So how can you guys help? Again, still needs an IV. Look those paramedics in the eye. 
tell them tell them they need to put an IV in before they get to me. Um, they need to meet criteria. So this is your history, and it's I say paramedic history, but anyone anyone pre hospital history. Um, you know, when did it start? How long has this been going on for? This is actually gonna change who meets criteria for both thrombolysis or for endovascular thrombectomy. So that last seen normal in sample now, which is no longer last oral intake, because NAV is gonna intubate no matter what, um, is, is really important. And then for the brain perfusion, what could we do? Increasing brain perfusion. So instead of decreasing the amount of blood going to the brain, we wanna increase the amount of blood going to the brain. Anyone? Flip that, reverse it. All right, it's for, yeah, exactly. Yeah, supine, head of the bed down. Um, so these are different ways that you can intervene in the pre-hospital setting and help us. It is difficult. Like we know, there it's really hard to distinguish whether a stroke is ischemic or hemorrhagic and trying to you know, that we can if they perfectly meet one criteria and you are so convinced that it is ischemic stroke and they don't they have a protected airway that it doesn't matter if they're lying down maybe putting the head of the bed down is going to be helpful if they had that underclap headache and they're vomiting and now they're unconscious and you're waiting maybe and you don't need to be intervening on their airway as well Again, the ABCs always come first, but putting the head of the bed up might help. So different ways to think uh, that you can intervene, but uh, no slam dunk way of, uh, of diagnosing whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic in the field. So thrombolysis, uh, this is when we give something called alteplase or TPA, which is tissue plasma engine activator. This is an example of what happens inside an artery. So this, this big guy, this whole thing's an artery, this big guy here is a clot. And we have this little guy named Plasmin, who's the Pac-Man, and he eats clot and, and degrades it. And Plasminogen is the Pac-Man when he's inactivated. I like to think he's just sleeping. And TPA is that Plasminogen activator. So it activates Plasminogen into Plasmin, which then breaks down the clot. So you wake up the Pac-Man, Pac-Man eats the clot, clot goes away, and hey -oh, blood is restored to the brain. Will, will O2 be helpful? Yes, potentially. So giving oxygen, uh, I, I would recommend um, uh, titrating it, actually. Do you guys do uh, SpO2 monitoring in the field? Anyone? Okay, I don't, not, not in on. Okay, no SpO2. Okay, so you know what? Yeah, okay, if you have SpO2, you can titrate it. If they're above 94%, um, it's probably fine to, to leave them off it or put a nasal cannula in. If you're not, you, I would say go ahead and give oxygen because you, you're right, they do need extra oxygen going to that area of the brain uh, that has decreased perfusion. So giving a bit of extra oxygen can help. Um, perfect. There, there is some evidence coming out now how hyperoxia or too much oxygen can actually cause damage because you start generating free oxygen radicals, uh, but that's for a different talk. But yeah, when in doubt, if you don't have the ability and, and they're looking quite altered, uh, you can give oxygen. Uh, so then the endovascular thrombectomy, this is a kind of a new surgical technique where they actually thread a wire into the artery, go through that clot and open up a cage that grabs the clot and then pulls it out. Oh, I thought this was a video. It's not, it's a picture, but you get the, you get the idea. Um, and again, they have to meet certain criteria and this is ours at Island Health for EVT. Um, we're going to go through each one of the, no, I'm just kidding. You can look back on this if you want. But uh, there's a lot of criteria, including timing um, and, and information that you can get on your history in the field. So what about ASA? ASA is in, right? You guys give ASA in the field or no? That was another thing that flopped back and forth sometimes, back when I was in. Yes, sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Yeah. Not for stroke. Oh, hey. All right, answer my question. So I agree, yeah, and, and I think it would be bad for stroke. If somebody has an ischemic stroke and gets, um, gets diagnosed with it on a CT angio, we ultimately put them on antiplatelet therapy, and it's usually dual antiplatelet with aspirin as well as something else like Plavix or Ticagalor. Basically, we want to prevent those platelets from 
uh, aggregating together and creating another clot. But exactly right, it shouldn't be involved in um, a pre-hospital protocol because we aren't able to differentiate that. And as you can probably imagine, if we give somebody who's having a hemorrhagic stroke aspirin uh, and then we prevent any sort of potential clotting of their platelets, uh, we pretty much accelerate the bleeding and ensure their demise. So uh, yeah, not good, agreed. So aspirin is something that I, it feels like you want to give it, but hold off until we know exactly what's going on. And it, even if it is an ischemic stroke, it's not the same as a heart attack where it can make that time, uh, that time sensitive difference. It probably won't, wouldn't change the outcome as much. So some nomenclature and some terms, hot stroke, golden hour, you guys have probably heard these terms thrown around. So let's try and actually talk about what these mean because for the longest time, ever, I also, you know, I get paged overhead to go see a hot stroke, and I, you know, I thought it was someone who who had a stroke and had a fever, and I was like, oh, time to go see the hot stroke, and uh, uh, the golden hour. So that's what these actually mean. So this is this is our clinical order set at Island Health, and it's our hot stroke order set, and essentially it's blow up this one part here, and it talks about. Uh, is defined as the time of onset allowing for us to give TPA at f within 4.5 hours of onset. And if you look in the literature, or do research, or go through different protocols, you're going to find different times. This is ours at Island Health. Some say up to six hours, some say three hours. But basically, there is a defined point in time where giving TPA and giving that clot busting medication is going to be more harmful than it is beneficial. And can anyone think why that would be? Like why if someone comes to us eight hours after starting to have stroke-like symptoms, why can't we just try and bust that clot anyways? Anybody? Chat time. Repercussion injury. Kate, they'll bleed out. Morbid. Perfusion. Oh, reperfusion injury. Yeah. Reperfusion injury. Yeah. So yeah, essentially, put all those together, reperfusion injury, they'll bleed out, the body is already forming clots, the amount of damage. Yeah, exactly. So a few reasons. Uh, the thing that's hard to, to and, and damage is probably irreversible at that point. I think that's kind of hard to, a concept that's hard to grasp is our blood vessels actually have many tiny little blood vessels feeding the walls of the blood vessel themselves. And then those blood vessels, no, I'm just kidding. It's not like this ever, never ending cascade but they do our blood vessels have their own tiny blood vessels and eventually what's going to happen too is the blood vessels themselves will start to die and what that means for a stroke is if the blood vessels are reach a certain point say around 4.5 hours according to island health and all of a sudden then we thrombolize and break up all those clots all of a sudden that dead blood vessel is going to be weak and leaky and now all of a sudden gets a rush of blood again since we broke that big clot up and they're going to burst or they're going to leak or and we're going to get something called yeah reperfusion injury or hemorrhagic transformation where what was initially an ischemic stroke is now a bleed and that's very bad and makes you look bad and is bad for the patient. It's bad for everybody. So that's why we give this time constraint and say something like a hot stroke is there within that time frame where we can give that clot busting medication um, and do it more confidently uh, that we won't cause a hemorrhagic transformation and turn that ischemic stroke where the blood is blocked to a hemorrhagic stroke where blood's now going everywhere. Or Basically, what this comes from is uh, the fact that there have been lots of big studies that show that, oh, I have a thing that says my internet connection is unstable. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, a big thing, that, we have a lot of big studies that show that if all patients, regardless of uh, comorbidities and age and time, all these things put together, if people are treated within one hour of their symptom onset, they have much better outcomes. 
So that's why we call it the golden hour. If you can get somebody who is having that, that's why we have that T and fast and fast van is time to call 911 or time from onset because we want them to be seen within an hour of this happening. And because regardless of how old they are or their comorbidities, they're going to have a better outcome if we treat them within that hour. So that's what the golden hour is referring to. Stroke mimics. Whew. There are a lot of them. I'll give you a sec to read them. I'm just kidding. What I want you to do is go, I, I like this one. I didn't create this one. I didn't copyright this one like flops, which I still think is better. But because you guys are all, you know, first responders or MFRs or standard first aid, um, you're all kind of medics. So again, these are a lot of causes and there's like three M's and a few C's and some S's and it, it, it's something that if you like the monics and you can remember them, go for it uh, and you can have access to this. But um, there are a lot of things that can mimic it. And we already talked about some of the main ones are things like epilepsy or having a seizure and um, having and intoxication is a huge one with drugs or alcohol. Infection was brought up with the meningitis or an encephalitis. And then uh, we talked about uh, electrolyte for ease or electrolyte imbalance. And that would be something uh, such as glucose, uh, hypoglycemia causing this mimic. So lots of other things to think about. Um, cervical disc prolapse, if it pushes on an artery. Not so much if, if it pr pushes on an artery, but cervical disc prolapse can cause uh, radiating symptoms and neurologic symptoms, say down in arms. So you can get arm, focal arm weakness or numbness or the paresthesias. And then people can think that they're having a stroke, um, but then you scan their head or you do a good clinical exam and they don't have anything else like severe sciatica. Yes. But pro yeah. Or the sciatica of the arm essentially because the sciatic nerve is downstream. So we'll kind of wrap this up because I was trying to hit an hour and we're, we're at there right now. Um, Basically, always doing the primary survey, ABCs come first no matter what, but where you guys are going to really intervene and really help is in that history, and specifically, let's take that last oral intake and change it to last seen normal, pretty much for everything. You can do this with chest pain as well, or, or trouble breathing, or I, it still works, but specifically with this one, that piece of history is going to get relayed to the paramedics or to the doctors or whoever you're handing over patient care to. And that's going to influence what this patient gets, the treatment what, uh, that they receive. And so it's very important for us to know. Physical exam, uh, you can do your flops exam and you can include that blood glucose or point at the paramedic, make sure they get it and get those vital signs, those initial vital signs. So we know how they're trending and uh, along with your fast van, your LOC using AVPU instead of GCS, the orientation, um, and the rest of FLOPS. I'm forgetting my own acronym now. <laughs> and uh, definitive treatment wise, get an IV positioning. Again, if you're confident, you can try and position. Um, no one's gonna fault you if you, you position incorrectly. And sometimes the patient has a position where they feel most comfortable and usually we just give it there and um, we can leave them comfortable or protecting their airway. And then code three, what was flops again? Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, we'll go back to that in a sec. Um, and, uh, code three, getting, getting sent to a neuro hospital that can, uh, deal with this appropriately. Let me go back to flops. I know it's so good, right? Flops. There we go. Fast van, do that fast van, the av poo. Thank you, Gareth. And uh, orientation, pupils, just doing pearl, not perla. Um, and then doing a quick strength and sensation check. Can you squeeze my hands or squeeze my fingers, lift your feet, and then can you feel me at, on both hands and both feet? Right? Okay, now all the way back. Holy. Get there. So this is my email. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about this um, and uh, we can answer questions now. I'll leave this slide up. 
I am going to quickly do a, a, a shameless plug for Vicium. Those of you who are in Victoria, um, we do have a, I, I'm one of the founders of a non-for-profit here, which is the Victoria Interdisciplinary Collaboration in Emergency Medicine, brings together all people interested in emergency medicine, first responders, standard first aiders, physicians, paramedics, uh, nurses, and we go do high fidelity simulation se sessions in a state-of-the-art sim facility, um, which has obviously been on hold given the pandemic for the last few months, but we're going to get things started back up, and we're currently starting a uh, online education curriculum for just high yield emergency medicine topics, 10 minute videos for high yield pearls in emergency medicine. Um, and if you be members free, it comes along with, you can get discounts on ECG courses and other fun things. So consider stopping by or signing up. Um, we'd love to have you and we'll let you know when the events start happening again. Um, but we're getting some high yield speakers to do events as well. Um, so yeah, at this point, uh, any questions either in the chat or via video? I have a question if uh, you can hear my name is uh, uh, Gord, as you can see. Uh, would a person with a thalassemia minor have a higher chance of uh, stroke or not? That's a great question. Thalassemia minor. Different, and you're pushing me back to med school. Mediterranean. <laughs> Mediterranean, yeah. Um, Thalassemia minor is, which is I think is different than thalassemia trait, or the same. Do you remember that? Well, thal full thalassemia trait, uh, the longest it's ever lived uh, is uh, uh, what twenty nine. Uh, the minor is basically you have just one of the characters, so you're the carrier. I think thalassemia trait is when you don't exhibit symptoms, but you have it, and thalassemia major is the one that you have. Yes. I'm gonna go ahead and say yes, really confidently that there's a higher risk for something but I, I am making that up. I'm not going to lie to you. Okay, because it's, it's, a hemoglobin, the, uh, it's a hemoglobin problem. That much I do know about it, so I don't know yeah. if that made a difference. Totally. No, I know, I know what thalassemia is. I just don't know if it comes along with an increased risk for it. Um, yeah, I know. There are other physicians on here. Nav, do you know? <laughs> Anyone else? No, the reason why I ask is I'm from the Mediterranean. I, I have minor, actually, so it's... Oh, there you go. Then never mind. No increased risk. You're fine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there. Nav says small risk depends on alpha versus beta thalassemia. Yeah. So uh, thalassemia minor. Um, as a first aid emergency measure to lower BP, would massaging the carotid sinus at slash vagus nerve be effective or useful? More for minor versus straight. So um, would the massaging the carotid sinus? Uh, I would say no. Um, and the reason I would say no is it actually might be effective in that. So what they're talking about is carotid massage where you massage the carotid bulbs here on either side. And what you can do is uh, get a reflex where your body kind of lowers the blood pressure because it's sensing here. These are our kind of blood pressure sensors in our carotids. And it, by, by rubbing it, it's giving the brain, you're kind of tricking your body into saying that you have high blood pressure because you're pushing on it. And then the body responds and, and kind of vasodilates and lowers that blood pressure. But that can do a lot of, yeah, so Kate's right. It, it could cause syncope, it could cause them to lose consciousness. The other thing it can do is um, we don't always know where these strokes are coming from. And if the stroke came from a, a plaque that was built up in the carotid artery, if you massage that plaque, you could break off more of it. So often uh, we use carotid massage for trying to do a vagal maneuver for people with arrhythmias. But if you're going to attempt it at all, especially in somebody who's a bit older, uh, they say that you want to listen actually with your stethoscope over the carotid arteries to see if you hear a brewery, which is turbulent blood flow. Because if that's there, you definitely don't want to be massaging it, potentially breaking off a plaque um, and causing a, a worse stroke. So I would say that like ASA, it might actually accomplish what you're looking for in that it probably would lower the blood pressure, but it could also make things a lot worse. So I would definitely stay away from it in the pre-hospital setting. That makes sense. What can you do when you encounter stroke symptoms, but you have a long wait until EMS arrives? Any treatment that would help? You know, th this, this kind of comes down to what we were talking about before in that if you have that slam dunk presentation where perhaps this is an ischemic stroke and you're certain of that because they have focal findings, they have the arm drift and they're... Um, 
they're otherwise well, um, you might consider laying them down. You can check a glucose, make sure that if, if or have some of that ha can check a glucose. Um, if you're unclear or you're, or you're unsure and you don't know if they're, um, or if you don't have the ability to check a glucose, but their airway is protected, you could consider giving them some glucogel. Um, but again, only small amounts because glucogel is just disgusting. And even if you do it perfectly, it gets everywhere. Like, I don't know how, but it, it's an innate quality in glucogel that goes everywhere. So you could consider giving some glucose in case this is a mimic. Uh, you could try line them down. If you think it's ischemic, you could try sitting them up if you think it's hemorrhagic. Um, and again, monitor those ABCs. If they're starting to become so decreased that they can't protect their airway, you're gonna need to put them in uh, probably the semi-recumbent position on their side so they can protect their airway. And that's actually a really good point. So if, if, if say somebody was having a stroke and they were having a, a very large facial droop um, and you decide that their airway is no longer protected and you wanted to roll them onto their side, what side would you roll them onto? Anybody? Le left, always left. <laughs> Para up, Un onto unaffected side. Yeah, so those are all correct. So you want the, the unaffected side. So if I'm having a, a facial droop, I want facial droop side up. And the reason for that is that means the right side of my face is, yeah, exactly, affected side up. Because uh, if the right side of my face is working and I'm lying on that side, all my secretions are gonna pool in that area, and I want to be able to use that part of my face to clear the secretions and spit the spit it out. Otherwise, if you pull me on this side and there's you know saliva or I vomit or anything goes into the uh, the droopy side, I can't clear those, and I have a higher risk of aspirating the contents. Yeah. Also, what about transportation, flight or land? Whichever's faster. It's simply what it comes down to. We have people that get helicoptered to us because they live on a, a Gulf Island and they going on the ferry for three hours wouldn't help. Um, but if you can get to us faster, if you're downtown and you can get to us by car rather than having a helicopter land on the highway, then I would recommend that one. Uh, left or right changes. Oh, 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 I get the question now. Left or right changes from land to air, transport packaging. Um, oh yeah, so th that's actually, I, I don't know how the current flight uh, ambulances are set up, but essentially I, I do think it, you know, it, it's gonna be a risk benefit kind of discussion with yourself in that if you need to package them on their side, um, if, if, the, if you have to put them on the affected side down, but that also means they're facing you and you can more easily assess their airway and suction them out, that might be more appropriate. Whereas if you think there's no way you can, like they're, they're constantly vomiting and you need them to be able to cre clear their own secretions, they're able to do it. It might be worth turning them away from you and making a little bit more of an awkward trip for you. Uh, but if they're able to clear their own secretions more effectively, because being able to spit out vomit is much more effective than us going in with this little yank or suction tube and trying to get all the chunks, right? So it, it's gonna be that risk benefit discussion that, that you have to have with yourself in, in the context. Um, the high level of care can repackage for transport. Confirmed, they can. Nice. Oh, oh, hold on, I missed one. Is there, oh God, scrolling. Oh no. Is there a way to differentiate between a stroke and a TIA? And is treatment with TPA indicated for both due to time limitations for the treatment window? So is there a way to differentiate? No, other than the symptoms will go away. And uh, so, but in the acute phase, certainly, certainly not. If you have somebody who has that, that arm or the facial droop and the arm drift and the slurred speech, and then by the time they get to the hospital, it's all gone. Um, I'd say that's more likely a TIA because everything is resolved pretty quickly, but otherwise it's the same symptoms because it's the same area of the brain is getting lack of blood supply. The only difference is permanent damage hasn't happened yet. Um, is treatment with TPA indicated for both? You know, if, uh, it's, it's hard to say T TPA is something that we're going to do if we 
if we find that clot, if we get that CT angio and we see a clot, if that's a clot that was going to resolve on its own, um, we might never know that. But if we find a clot and it's within that hour and they're still having those deficits, we're not willing to say, ah, oh, this is probably a TPA and just, or sorry, a TIA and uh, just let, let them be and hope they recover. We're going to give that thrombolysis. Most helicopters used now, the patient can go supine. All right. Uh, I was meaning regarding the pressure in the brain for flight, up to flight crew. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, meaning like uh, the cabin in the flight ambulances are pressurized up to 5,000 feet? Any, are there any flight paramedics here? I don't know, 2,000. Okay, so maybe tell them, look them in the eye and tell them to fly at 2,000 feet. And yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that, that's specialized training that I don't have because I'm not a flight guy. Any other questions, chat or video wise? Anna, did I miss any questions? No, I, I don't think you did. I think you hit all of them that I saw at least. All right, all right. Thank you for, oh, you're welcome. Um, yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. That's kind of my, oh, am I frozen? Nope. <laughs> You are now. <laughs> oh, good. I'm back. Okay. You're back. Yeah. <laughs> what an appropriate time to freeze. <laughs> um, yeah. So please feel free to reach out for me or to me if you have any questions about any of this, the, anything you saw in the talk. Um, I answer emails sometimes. Um, takes me a little bit longer sometimes, but uh, I'll, I'll try and get to all of them. But oh, very good. Thanks, Cam Loops. Um, yeah, uh, and stay safe out there, wear your masks, social distance, and seconds is cells. All right, thanks so much, Sam, that was great. Um, I'll just do a little blurb about next week. Uh, most of you would have gotten the email. Uh, next week we have former Division 176 member Bianca Jackson coming to teach us. She's currently doing research with Johns Hopkins University in a very current field, in the very current field of epidemiology. So she'll be teaching us something about that next week, but she's asked that if anybody has questions on the topic to uh, send them to me so that I can forward them to her so that she can kind of tailor her presentation to what you guys want to know about. So um, most of you should have my email, send me any questions so that I can forward them. Otherwise, uh, this session has been recorded and we'll get it posted to our YouTube channel maybe tomorrow, we'll go with tomorrow or the day after and get it all sent out to you uh, along with the link to Bianca's talk. Um, I'll stick around running this chat for a few more minutes. Nick, I think you had a slide you wanted to pop up if you wanna do that now. Yeah, it's it's up. I just I've tried to share my. Oh, there it is. You to accept it, and uh, that'll have uh, Anna's email and uh, a little plug for our own social media stuff as well. Yeah. So my email was down at the bottom. Uh, email me any questions for Bianca there. Otherwise, stay tuned for the invite for next week. Um, yeah, that's about it from me. We'll keep this going. If anybody has last minute questions for Sam, throw them in the chat or turn on your mics and we can talk and I'll kind of turn this off once people file out of the session. <laughs>